I've been playing video games for as long as I can remember, enjoying a wide range of genres across generations of hardware. That is at least 19 years of gaming at this point, which leaves me with a ton of nostalgia towards so many different games. From Crash Bandicoot to Wolfenstein, Ratchet and Clank to Halo, and just too many more to name. However, to celebrate hitting 1,000 subscribers, I wanted to cover a game that would begin a series that is not only one of my all-time favourites in gaming, but would begin a new genre altogether. I didn't begin the series with Demon Souls, and instead, like many others, I was introduced to this series with Dark Souls. I'll save my overly long nostalgia story for that video, but after becoming obsessed with Dark Souls, playing it for hundreds to thousands of hours, hunting down all the achievements, attempts at speedrunning, to watching videos about the game's lore, PvP battles, speedruns, you name it. If it had anything to do with Dark Souls, I watched it. It's from all these videos that I would finally learn about Demon Souls, and once again found myself obsessed. From Software has a fascinating history, being established all the way back in 1986, but didn't create their first game until 1994. So what were they doing for 8 years? Well initially From Software's main business was to develop commercial software. For example, they worked with the Japanese Agricultural Association and created a software for managing pig feed. They would do this for about 4 years or so before Japan's economy ran into trouble in the early 1990s, and the need for this market was shrinking rapidly. From Software needed to figure out what they were to do instead. Several members of From Software had become intrigued in making games through interest in 3D modelling, as they began work on an action game for PC with 3D CGI graphics as the player navigated around an underground labyrinth but stopped work on the game unhappy with the hardware at the time. From Software would end up waiting until 1994, just before Sony's PlayStation released to begin developing their first game after the pitch to Sony was successful. This project was Kingsfield and featured a development that lasted less than 6 months with a team of about 10 people. Kingsfield was published by From Software in December 1994, just under 2 weeks after the release of the PlayStation in Japan, and was the first RPG released for the system. Kingsfield shows From Software's game design philosophy to this day, as the game featured grim and dark locales, and was also, apparently, a pretty brutal game. However, Kingsfield has never seen a release outside of Japan other than some fan translations, and it wasn't until Kingsfield 2, or Kingsfield outside of Japan, that the rest of the world got to experience From Software's game design. From Software has developed a surprising amount of games, and I won't be going over their entire history, as I'm here to talk about Demon Souls. But Armored Core is another important series in the Soulsborne journey, as it was with this series that the legendary Hidetaka Miyazaki began his work at From Software with Armored Core Last Raven in 2004, and would go on to direct Armored Core 4 and 4 Answer. Whilst working on the Armored Core series, Miyazaki heard about a project elsewhere in the studio called Demon Souls that wasn't going well. The project was having problems with the team unable to create a compelling prototype. The fact that the game was intended to be a fantasy action RPG excited Miyazaki as he felt if he could find a way to take control of the game, he could turn it into anything. And if he couldn't, and he failed, nobody would care because it was already a failure. The problem before Miyazaki entered the picture was the team didn't have a coherent vision for Demon Souls, 
hence the difficulties. But with Miyazaki taking over the project, he made his intentions clear for the game. Miyazaki looked to Kingsfield, citing its dark tone and high difficulty as main inspirations, and hoped to take gaming back to its basics, creating a challenging gameplay-based experience that he had noticed was dying out in the industry. The team's focus for Demon Souls was to have a strong emphasis on gameplay, centered around accomplishment through failure. This concept was even so drastic early on that the team looked to introduce permadeath, which was quickly deemed as going too far, thank goodness. The game's difficulty was one aspect of Demon Souls that Miyazaki kept rather quiet and vague about when discussing the Soul system to Sony. He believed if they knew the game would take away the player's souls after failure, they would request lowering the difficulty, which would take away from the team's goal of accomplishment through failure. Miyazaki brought leadership and direction to Demon Souls, but this doesn't mean the development for the game was all sunshine and rainbows. This is noticeable in-game with the sixth archstone being broken. From Software would manage to explain this broken archstone in the story, but in reality it was an issue of budgetary and time constraints, which resulted in the stage being scrapped. Demon Souls didn't end up coming together in a playable form until late in the game's development, with several aspects of the game proving difficult. The multiplayer mechanics were a prime source of struggles during development, especially in regards to the old monk battle which involves summoning another player during the boss fight. This caused a lot of grief because it kept creating a high number of bugs and network issues the team would constantly have to try and fix. Even in the end product though, network issues were a problem. A few months before Demon's Souls release, the game was shown at the Tokyo Game Show and was received rather negatively. Many players not even making it past the character creator screen. And then the game released. Demon's Souls released in Japan in February 2009 to very little fanfare, selling around 20,000 copies in the week of its release, which was far fewer than expected by Sony. The game's low sales resulted in Sony deciding against localizing the game for Western markets, a decision they would later regret because people were beginning to find out more and more about the game, and the demand for the game was now there. Atlas took over the publishing rights for Demon's Souls in North America and released in October 2009, and Bandai Namco picked up the rights for publishing in Europe and Australia. My fellow Aussies and Europeans would have to wait until June 2010 though. Demon's Souls not only saw a boost of triple the original's estimate sales figures after localizing, but the game had built up a cult following, who enjoyed the game so much that the original talk was to close the multiplayer servers in 2011, but didn't close until 2018 through fan outcries. Demon Souls began a failure, seemingly released to be a dud, and yet through word of mouth, more and more people heard about the game and became excited to play it. Demon's Souls takes place in the Kingdom of Boletaria, a kingdom attacked by a creature known as the Old One after abusing a forbidden magic called Soul Art. This attack led to the world nearly being lost to a deep fog filled with soul-eating demons until the Old One was lulled into slumber which saved Boletaria and saw the damaged world become populated with humans known as Monumentals. This is all in the past though, as in the present, King Alant, ruler of Boletaria, has restored the Soul Arts. Once again, the Old One, along with its demon army within the returning fog, sees Boletaria become consumed by demons yet again. This is where the player comes into the picture. We take the role of an adventurer entering the fog that is engulfing the kingdom, and after being quickly killed, we awaken in the Nexus, where we are bound to remain until the Old One is returned back to its slumber. This objective takes the player through five regions of Boletaria as we kill the region's demons that control these areas, 
Once we get to King Alant, we meet a demon imposter, or false King Alant, and through defeating him, the Maiden in Black takes us to the Old One. Here is where we find and face the true King Alant, now a helpless slug within the Old One. After taking care of the Slug King is where we can either let the Maiden lull the Old One back to sleep, and allow the kingdom to forget the soul arts once again and have Boletaria recover from the attacks. Or we can kill the Maiden and serve the Old One and continue to spread the fog throughout the world. This is the game's main goal that is set up through a few cutscenes and as I said in the development section, story was not a big focus for Demon Souls. The game's goal is simplistic in terms of the middle aspect which is playing the game. But what this story does well is set up this world. You learn what the kingdom of Boletaria's basic history is and what the kingdom is like today very quickly. This introduction sets up a world that perfectly complements the gameplay. Boletaria is grim, it's somber, a place where all sense of hope is essentially gone. But if the player can face this adversity, there may just be a chance. Can you face failure to reach that feeling of accomplishment and in turn save the kingdom? That depends on you. Again, it's a simple goal, but effective. There is a lot more story you can experience, but it is up to you as to how much of it you want to experience. Don't care about Demon Souls story? Awesome. You won't have to experience much of it, just enjoy the gameplay. If you do care, you're in luck because much like Bioshock, there is a lot of lore and backstory that allow you to learn more about this world and its inhabitants if you want it. This approach lets players who are interested in the world of Boletaria become further invested. There are so many different ways to accrue more information through item descriptions, optional character dialogue, even just archstone descriptions for each region. If you go out of your way and do this, you can learn a lot about this world. It's just up to you if you want more information. Not all the game's lore is easy to find, with out of the way characters and items, but when you do find these hidden nuggets of information, it feels like you're uncovering a secret. Usually there is a bit of risk in acquiring this secretive information, but much like the gameplay, it has a great balance of risk versus reward. Demon Souls characters are the best source of information, for myself at least, because I get to listen to them instead of reading. The characters' dialogue may also seem more interesting to me because of how the lines of dialogue are delivered by the voice actors. Go forth, touch the demon inside me. From Stockpile Thomas and his story of leaving his family. When I came to, I found myself here, in the Nexus. My wife and daughter fell victim to the demons. Ostrava setting up Boletaria's palace demons and his quest to reach his father the king. The last hero is old King Doran. King Doran is the everlasting one, founder of Boletaria and protector of the two swords. <laughs> of course, only according to legend. The more obscure Ed and Baldwin, the blacksmiths that set up the theory that Flame Lurker is the legendary Big M, not talking about the milk, through looks, weapons, and the location. Our first time experiencing patches, that dick who keeps coming back, or the crestfallen warrior, letting the player experience what happens when those in soul form don't reconnect with the body. These characters help expand your world knowledge, and most of them are in the Nexus anyway, so it's easily accessible information that helps me invest more in this world. Each region of Boletaria has its own story and aesthetic, from standard medieval fantasy, to mines that go all the way down to hell, Lovecraftian horror, to crypts, and of course a From Software favourite, swamps. Demon's Souls has a much darker and horror-esque aesthetic than the rest of the series. The environments only further help that feeling of dwindling hope, with the perfect example being the Tower of Latria. The brain-dead, hollowed enemies guarded by Cthulhu-like creatures as you progress through this prison. Learning of the Archdemons playing with the remaining citizens' hope of escaping, with the fool's idol mimicking their dead queen. It's dark, and by far the most interesting location further expanded through lore. There are instances where the game's lore does affect the gameplay, but I'll get into that soon. 
There is so much more lore in this game, but to get through it all would take far too long to dive into. For a game where story was not a focus, there is a surprising amount here if you want it. But again, this extra world building, characters and backstory is all completely optional. However, whilst I love learning more about the world of Boletaria, I fell in love with the series for its gameplay. Demon Souls is a game that feels very much like the beginning of the Souls series. I know, it sounds obvious, but in terms of a retrospective purpose, now having played through the rest of the games many times at this point, and coming back to where it all began, you see where some aspects of the series started and how they evolved over time. If you've played any of the series before, you'll know what makes up the core of a Souls experience, but maybe there are some of you who haven't who are watching, so let's explain the core gameplay for Demon Souls. You'll begin the game choosing a starting class. The class you choose is more so a decision towards stats than equipment, as you'll likely change your loadout within the first few stages. So what stats are you looking for to benefit you in the near future? You aren't locked into any particular build and can choose the Magician or Royalty class at the start and then progress to focus on melee. Changing your build in terms of stats does require leveling up an aspect that is likely lower than if you chose another class more suited to that playstyle and will require a bit more work on your end as a result. Once you choose a class, you'll be asked if you want to complete a tutorial that shows you the basics to the game's combat and general gameplay. You have a lot of options for combat, from the basic light and heavy attacks, blocking, the option for two-handing a weapon, giving you more damage output, but leaving you with no shield, backstabbing which can involve heavy circling but deals big damage, and the biggest form of risk versus reward Parrying an enemy's attack to follow with a riposte for a ton of damage. There is no plunging attacks though that was added in Dark Souls along with refillable health items. Here in Demon Souls we have different herbs that heal for varying amounts of health. But unlike Bloodborne, there doesn't seem to be a limit and if there is, you can have a lot. Again though, depending on your playstyle, you may also have access to magic or miracles that can act offensively or defensively. Now depending on your weapon and what enemy you're facing is where the game's difficulty comes into play. Each weapon class will have variations in their timing and attack speed, their attack motion and moveset and where on the weapon is the most lethal. The controls for the weapons don't change, but learning their range and effectiveness does, and same goes for the enemies. You'll be able to tell early on what different enemies are from a distance, from up close, mid range, and range, but you'll need to learn their attacks, attack patterns, and what weapons or magic will be most effective, which also applies to the bosses. It's from learning attack patterns and your own equipment that you'll be able to assess the risk, reward of parrying or backstabbing. That's the basics in terms of combat, broken down to its core, but all of this is easier said than done in game. You'll gain souls, the game's currency, for defeating enemies and bosses to go towards leveling up your equipment or stats, and you'll lose your souls and have one chance to retrieve them if you die. I'll go into more specifics soon, but I want to talk about the tutorial boss fight and Boletaria Palace, or 1-1, in a bit of detail as it helps explain the gameplay loop to expect for the whole game. Now, you are supposed to die at some point in the tutorial, but you can beat the Vanguard. He's pretty easily cheesed into a constant flying motion, but he is a great introduction boss to help new players learn that you aren't a tank and bosses along with tough enemies will destroy you. If you do manage to beat the Vanguard though, you get rewards to begin the game with at the Dragon God's Temple. Again, the game letting you know if you can push through Demon's Souls challenge, there are rewards for your efforts. You do get one hit KO'd shortly after though as the game forces you to the Nexus. Beating the Vanguard isn't too hard, but it feels satisfying because of the rewards you get to begin the game with. And it does set up that oh damn feeling in terms of you know you'll have to fight the Dragon God at some point, which from our first encounter is a terrifying proposition that ultimately doesn't pay off. From the Nexus is where we are introduced to the Archstones and our first stage, Boletaria's Palace, 
which you have to do first before you can progress in whatever order you please amongst the different archstones. Boletaria Palace or 1-1 is a great introduction stage that introduces you to a lot of mechanics for the game. The boss is right at the beginning, but you need to unlock the gate first. This involves you going in and out of the castle to get to the switch that unlocks the gate and gives us access to the fight. A simple setup, but it teaches us a couple of things that are important. First of all, it teaches us about shortcuts, because as I said, if you unlock the gate and die, the boss is right there when you respawn. This encourages exploration of the levels to help the player make death feel less punishing, if you can locate a shortcut within the stage. Second of all, and tied to exploration, is pay attention to loot drops and items amongst the level. We find a lot of fire-based items such as fire bombs and turpentine foreshadowing phalanx, this area's boss's weakness to fire. We can learn this weakness earlier than the fight itself as we have a few of phalanx's minions just before the boss sharing its weakness. It rewards you for paying attention to items throughout the level that will come in handy in some regard. Phalanx as a boss isn't too difficult, but he really is the game's first boss, so it's to be expected. Really he is used more as a lesson of paying attention than an actual fight. After defeating Phalanx, the rest of the area opens up much more, as you can progress through the areas in any order you please. It really comes down to personal preference and what areas you feel like you'll be able to tackle with the current build. Between the 5 archstones there are 16 stages to get through. 12 of these stages are your standard souls formula I just described which have you progressing through a level to reach a boss at the end. That leaves 4 stages though. In these 4 stages in Stonefang, Latria, Shrine of Storms and Valley of Defilement the final stage is dedicated to fighting that world's archdemon and contain no exploration or journey to the boss. Each of the stages that revolve around the standard gameplay loop all fit within their Ares theme, but do change quite a lot from stage to stage. Boletaria for instance is set in a castle, but as you enter the castle, cross a bridge, exploring the castle to finally reaching the palace. The mines of Stonefang have you progressively diving deeper and deeper, not only seeing more enemies be introduced, but has you feeling like you're diving deep into the earth's core. Latria has you begin in a dark prison filled with mindless zombies and Cthulhu-like guards, to going higher in the tower to find gargoyles and a dark swamp. The Shrine of Storms begins as an open area as you explore the rubble, but progressing further to find crypts and spectral creatures. Lastly, the Valley of Defilement begins as you traverse dangerous platforms that could fall beneath you to a dark swamp that makes you constantly feel in danger as you can barely see. Each area has their own atmosphere, and much like the story in Finding Lore, Progressing further into an area feels like you are unlocking secrets to what the actual area is like at its core. With the game's changing of themes, you also get exposed to a wealth of enemies to learn and fight. But the challenge isn't so much with the enemies themselves, but their placement in levels. You want to fight enemies one on one, but that is easier said than done. You'll face melee and range enemies, big and small, fast and slow, all placed in very specific ways. Some enemies you'll see coming, others will ambush you, and you have to deal with these sometimes amongst effects from the area itself, like poison or plague. Each area has different ways of trying to attack you through its enemies like the Valley of Defilement and its use of ambushes and mobs. Stone Fang and the enemy's weaknesses to piercing attacks but not much else. The Shrine of Storms and a mix of fast moving enemies that do a ton of damage along with flying stingrays that won't leave you alone. Or Latria and the Cthulhu guards who stun you and eat you. You can never be too confident because not only will the enemies quickly kill you, but when you're not paying attention is when mistakes like falling to your death come into the picture. The levels themselves are a bulk of Demon Souls challenge and getting through areas avoiding all these hazards was some of the most fun I had in the game because once you reach the bosses, as I said, even if you are struggling, you've more than likely opened a shortcut or know the level enough now that getting back to that point isn't too much of a problem. The Valley of Defilement and Shrine of Storms though are areas I do dread revisiting even today. 
The valley isn't too bad, but its second stage is just a little too dark for my liking with no real feeling of direction. And it's a swamp, so you gotta deal with poison with no indication of how close you are to being poisoned. The Shrine of Storms is just a pain though, with small walkways mixed with quick enemies and these stupid flying stingrays that don't leave you alone. I almost gave up on playing the game multiple times after completing all the other stages except for this one. I didn't like it at all. Demon Souls can also have its fair share of tedium, like climbing up and down ladders being incredibly slow. To make traversing the bridge easier, shooting down the dragon, which for someone who didn't upgrade the boat, takes about 100 or so arrows, or if you want to upgrade weapons with specific ores, it will involve some farming. These aspects can slow down the game's pace, but not enough that I'd say it's a problem. Feels more like some personal nitpicks. It's important to talk about what you will be doing in between the stages though, and that's where the Nexus comes in. After you complete an area, you'll have a chunky amount of souls to spend on improving your build, whether that be leveling up, upgrading your weapons, or buying miracles or magic. Upgrading your weapons can sometimes involve a bit of farming like I mentioned, but your weapons or offense is for me the most important aspect to level up. You have so much variety in terms of upgrade paths. You can use boss souls to create new weapons or magic. And even though leveling up is important, once I found my build I wanted and had the stats for it, leveling up was more about increasing my health and stamina for a bit of vanity. You can't win on defense, so you need to be improving your damage output. There are so many different builds you can make from this relatively simple system. Even more so before the servers were closed eliminating PvP. You had builds focused on PvE and PvP. So I encouraged that, let me try something new or start the game again mentality. The bosses for the Souls series are usually the highlights of the experience though, so how does Demon Souls boss fights hold up? The bosses are still for the most part a great time, whether it be the man-eaters and the threat of not only falling off the arena, but making sure you can kill or nearly kill one of these things before the second one arrives. This was a great fight. Flame Lurker does a ton of damage and again it has a variety of attacks from melee to fire explosions, forcing you to be on your toes at all times. False King Alant was another great one, having the ability to take away your hard earned levels if you aren't quick enough to dodge, and resulted in him being by far the most stressful fight for me personally, and a fight that would have suited the final boss fight for the game. The false idol making sure you've been exploring enough because if you haven't, she won't die. I could name so many others like the Tower Knight or the Penetrator Stop it. that whilst I don't believe are the hardest fights by any means are a great test of your skills and do evoke that feeling of satisfaction for defeating them. You can never be too confident or the big no-no in the Souls community too greedy. But some bosses, while still enjoyable, will let you stand in front of them for a little too long, allowing you to get off Stop. massive amounts of damage. As long as you back off every now and again to heal when needed, you should be just fine. There are some boss fights that don't live up to their potential though, like the old hero, who could have been this berserker type fight from Gears of War, because he's blind, but it doesn't quite meet that potential. Again, still had a lot of fun with the boss fights despite for the most part being the easiest aspect of their levels. To be fair though, this isn't my first time playing through the game, so it could just be that. There are some bosses though that are just huge letdowns. There is three boss fights that I find personally just sad. The Dragon God boss fight is the big one. You get an epic build up through the intro cutscene along with being one hit KO'd in the tutorial, I need to reach him and push two buttons and attack his head that is now stuck in place. Getting to these buttons isn't easy as he will still one hit kill you, but overall it is just a really lame fight that ends up disappointing. The reason for this fight being the way it is, is explained through the game's lore, but it doesn't make up for the truth of the fight being lame to participate in. Maiden Australia is also a little lacklustre as she sort of just necks herself, but I do buy this a little more in terms of lore and her having a demon soul to try and save the valley. 
True King Alant though is a terrible final fight and way to end the game after you've been on such a rich and fulfilling journey. He barely attacks, moves, really does nothing. That is just 3 out of 17 or so boss fights, but for me they're such big disappointments because 2 are arch demons or final bosses for their areas, and True King Alant is the final boss. It can just leave a little sour taste after what is likely a tough journey to get to that point. Before I finish talking bosses though, I have to talk about the game's soundtrack. Demon Souls was surprisingly quiet for a lot of the game, which feels rather eerie, especially in Latria. The soundtrack is almost exclusively for the boss fights and has a horror-like, unsettling vibe that makes it very different from the other games in the series and makes a few of the boss fights that weren't too difficult still feel intense. Overall though, the soundtrack is brilliantly composed by Shunsuke Kida and matches well with the game's atmosphere and more horror-like elements. Now you may have noticed that there has been two different playthroughs I've been going between when talking about Demon Souls. I played through the game twice for this video, with one playthrough with my standard build of a heavy weapon with light armor, and another to showcase how the game's bosses' weaknesses don't change much from Phalanx. If a boss isn't weak to fire, it's magic. These two weaknesses are just a little too easy to exploit and have weapons or spells that deal this type of damage you can quickly acquire. I do want to make it clear that the Soul series does have what the community would deem as an easy build in each of the games, but you can get the necessary items for this build within three stages. I had a lot of fun with both my playthroughs of the game, but one was definitely easier than the other, and I just wish there was that variation in weaknesses that made me need to change weapons and abilities at least sometimes. But at the same time, if you are looking to get into the Soul series, because of this aspect, I think Demon Souls is a great entry point for newcomers, and the basics of the series do carry through to later entries. An aspect of Demon Souls though that isn't in the other games are world tendencies. Each archstone, depending on a number of different actions you can do in that world, will either positively or negatively affect the world tendency between black and white. Depending on the world's tendency, you will encounter different events in that area, along with affecting how you experience an area. White world tendency decreases enemy health and attacks, and sees enemies drop more healing items, but drop fewer upgrade stones and less souls. Black world tendency acts the opposite. Enemies have more health and increased attack damage, but they hold more souls and are more likely to drop rarer items along with more black phantoms in specific locations. This is a really great mechanic as depending on tendencies you will have access to different world events and tendencies that can fluctuate heavily especially if you die in human form. I won't pretend to fully understand the mechanic and how other objectives increase your world tendency one way or another, but whilst it may sound like new players will experience a more difficult game, that isn't the case. Again, an easy way to swing towards black tendency is dying in human form. So if you remove human form in the nexus, die, it doesn't affect an area. Also, you get far greater rewards if you do reach this tendency, making it easier to improve your character. The world tendencies are a great mechanic and something that we don't see in later games, which is unfortunate. Demon's Souls does have its share of technical issues, especially in regards to frame rate. Most of the time it is a non-issue, like the Dragon God fight as he throws his first punch, but it is a slippery slope because of the game's difficulty relying on your deaths feeling like they were your mistakes. So when the game's frame rate drops, even if you just get touched, it can feel a little cheap. 
I believe the frame rate issues have been resolved through emulation, but if you are playing the game through the PS3, this is worth noting. There are also some glitches I stumbled across, but these were harmless. On the whole though, the gameplay for Demon Souls is still really strong, and despite some lacklustre boss fights and some balancing issues, I couldn't get enough of playing the game even today. I mean, I played it twice for this video. It's gotta say something. Demon Souls being the beginning of the Souls series was a game I was a little worried about revisiting. As I said in the beginning, it's a game I do hold a lot of nostalgia for, but it is also a game I've played through too many times to count, and because of this I do notice some issues more prominently through my hours and hours of playtime. Yes, I do have my problems with Demon Souls. And I think the formula for the Soul series was only perfected more and more over time. But Demon's Souls is still a great game to this day to play. The game is imbalanced with too many enemies sharing the same weaknesses. Some of the boss fights with massive potential unfortunately fall flat. And I don't love every area. But when I compare these issues to the amount of great things the game does, it almost feels irrelevant. The game set up a story and lore system that spawned a whole genre on YouTube and expanded the world and backstory without shoving it down your throat. The gameplay whilst at times feeling like I'm playing the very first attempt at the Souls formula still feels great and rewards the player for learning more about weaknesses, enemy placement, different weapons and maneuvers. No. The game isn't perfect, but Demon Souls still very much holds up today, and I'm glad I could cover this game to celebrate such a big milestone for the channel. I'd love to see the game remastered at some point to take care of some technical issues, but until then, if you've still got a PS3 or the PS3 emulator, I do highly recommend either revisiting this game or picking it up and playing it for the first time. It is still a great time to this day and a game I do truly appreciate for beginning not only one of my favourite series of all time, but creating a new genre entirely.